Welcome, my friends, to the Sage Aquay Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Tonight, Sophia Smallstorm and Alex Scott return to the show for a roundtable discussion about the recent Parkland, Florida high school shooting. Sophia explains how these events are driven by corporate contracts to expand the control of the puppet masters, as Alex offers his professional insights from the perspective of law enforcement. And so without further ado, here's the show with Sophia and Alex. Well, folks, we're going to have a very interesting show. This afternoon, my two guests are Sophia Smallstorm and Alex Scott. Both Sophia and Alex were with me when we did the Las Vegas show a few months ago. We talked about the uh, the Vegas shooting. Today is going to be about what took place in Florida. And we're going to cover a couple of things that we have touched on in the past. We're going to uh, get into some details about some of the discrepancies that uh, we have all noted, and the fact that we should be questioning these events, that we should not be sitting back and just taking the mainstream narrative at face value. Also, we're going to get into the fact that um, these events appear to be leading down a path where it's a mental health issue, where the diagnosis is going to be done by the police, and the police are not trained in mental health, they're not psychiatrists, they're not psychologists, so we'll get into that a little bit. And so, even though a lot of folks are looking at this as a, a gun grab, we're going to have a slightly different take on it, and I know that Sophia will take us through it, but perhaps it's not a gun grab, but it's a people grab. And so with that, what I'd like to do is to kick this show off, Sophia, with you, because we need to talk about the Capstone event again. We talked about it in the Las Vegas show. And it took a lot of people, I got a lot of emails from that show, by surprise, because they were unaware that there was an exchange of money and it was contractual and all that stuff. And when they listened to the show, some of the dots started to get connected for these folks. And so they're starting to understand this a little more, what these events are really about. And so why don't you just take us to the Capstone event once again, uh, because I don't think we can talk about it enough People really need to get their heads wrapped around what this is. Sure. Thank you, Mike, for having me back. Well, as I covered in my Sandy Hook presentation several years ago, these events are actually training exercises performed by local agencies and departments and supervised or overseen by FEMA and Department of Homeland Security. They're called Integrated Capstone Events, ICE. And just to refresh, they're pyramidic in their organization. There is a pyramid on our dollar bill. And at the very top of that pyramid is this thing that we know to be the all-seeing eye. So in the pyramidic structure of capstone events, the people at the very top of the pyramid know what's going on. They are the all-knowing, all-seeing. And as you go down the pyramid at the very base, though that's the rank that's lowest and the number of people that's greatest. So they don't necessarily know what's going on. They might know that it's an exercise. The people at the bottom of the pyramid are the greatest in number and the lowest in rank. So all they know is that they're involved in some kind of exercise that then goes awry and becomes chaotic and they have to act on their best judgment and using the training that they have. And that's all that they know to do, and that's where they end up. And it's very, very confusing. So when you look at the whole thing, there's a pyramid of organization that sits over the entire event, and then each resource team, each participating partner, as they're called, whether it's the hospital team or the sheriff's team or the, you know, press, there is a pyramid there as well. And the capstone, the very top of the pyramid, has the people who know what is happening. The other people don't necessarily know whether it's a drill gone live or if there was a shooter, who is he, where is he? Those people don't know. They have to just be put out to chase leads. In the press, for instance, this is why you get lots of conflicting reports and stories about the identity of this person or how many shooters. Because the people, the members of the press are just chasing what they know to chase. They're acting on their training and their best judgment. So the capstone event is 
a it's a training exercise conducted for expansion and upgrades within each department. So when you have a commercial situation, which is what all of this really is at its font, remember that the United States of America was incorporated back in the 1860s, 1869 to 71. And after that, all the states, the cities, the agencies, the divisions within the larger structures, they incorporated as well. So at this time, the cities and towns, hospitals, schools, police departments are all corporations. And the way that corporations interact is through commerce and contracts. So these capstone exercises are conducted by commerce and contract. They are a centralized contract issuing from the federal government, run through FEMA and DHS, paid for with money borrowed from the international banks. And that money can be borrowed ad nauseum. And then the event is, is broadcast by the press as real, and the public is made to swallow this information, which they're very, very inclined to do because nobody pays attention and nobody digs and everybody takes everything at face value. And the more drama and emotion folded in, the better the recipe. So that's what is going on. The installation of the police state is being conducted through these exercises, all of which qualify the participating resource teams the partners for expansion and upgrades, which means more money. And that's how the police state is being drilled in to our lives, installed under our noses by commerce and contracts. Now, Sophia, you mentioned that the media was just chasing leads. Now, I would argue that maybe there are some that are chasing leads, but it seems to me that most of the media is complicit and they are actively participating in this contractual agreement. Well, part of the exercise is conducting real-time documentation. So real-time documentation means filling in logs. It means doing interviews. And the media, maybe the lower levels of media personnel, conduct an interview in the drill part of the drill. But then some chaos ensues, and they're told that, a shooting occurred and they start to do interviews in that context. I actually couldn't say, because I'm not there and I'm not a participant, what degree of reality these people think they're participating in. Yeah, that's the question, is how much do they know? And if the local news media, as an example, is unknowing, it appears to me what's happening is they are fed witnesses. So... If a local news person is unknowing and they're asking questions of a witness, a supposed witness, this witness could very well be an actor, or what many are referring to as crisis actors, a plant that has been put there to dialogue with a local reporter. I mean, that's just a premise that I have. What do you think of that? Well, I'll say this, that it is interesting that only a small number of people are interviewed when these events take place meaning witnesses. And yet there are usually thousands of people at something like a high school, right? Right. That's right. That's a very good point. That's something that I have noticed also. We have a kludge of a handful of people, especially in this case here. We've got, what, maybe five to seven of these kids. And uh, overnight, they have become uh, spokespeople for what went on in Florida. They are gun control advocates now. They have... Uh, they're superstars in the media. They're on major media outlets. And so this is something that we have to question because this is not normal. This is not natural. This is not a, a natural flow, especially when you're dealing with teenagers, 16, 17, 18 years old. I, I'm sorry. It just does not seem to me to be realistic. And it looks like to me that the people that we're seeing on TV, like the David Hoggs, they are there because they have been put there. They are part of the scheme that has been put in play to dupe the public and, like you said, to militarize the police departments. Militarize the nation. And I'd like Alex to weigh in here, uh, since we've not neglected to mention that Alex is a law enforcement uh, member himself. 
Yeah, well, just you know, just piggybacking on on what Sophia was saying uh, about that everything is being done under the guise of of a corporation and under the uh, Uniform Commercial Code or or the UCC. And you know, I tell people this quite frequently that this is actually how our system of government is now working. And every state does this. And of course, at first they don't believe. But I would just suggest that everybody go to Dun and Bradstreet. Just go to to the uh, Dun and Bradstreet website. Now, Dun and Bradstreet is the entity that assigns credit ratings for all corporations. So, if some if Microsoft would have a triple A plus corporate rating, it was given to them by Dun and Bradstreet. If you go and you type in your state, it's under Dun and Bradstreet. If you type in your Department of Health, it's under Dun & Bradstreet. If you type in your police agencies, they're all listed as a corporation under Dun & Bradstreet. Now, if they were not a corporate, in- a corporate entity, there would be no reason for them to be in Dun & Bradstreet. And also, if you look at your local laws for your state, they call them laws, but if you actually look delve deeper into them, they're actually referred to as statutes. They're referred to as law enforcement statutes, and they're corporate statutes. Um, so, you know, people in effect aren't necessarily violating the law. What they're doing is they're violating a corporate statute. And each state has a statute book, you know, for their criminal laws, and they still use the terms criminal law, but they also attach that statute name onto them. Um, because again, everything's run under uniform commercial code. Our courts, you know, our law enforcement, our, our, our fines, if you get a fine, you know, you violate a building code, you're technically violating a corporate statute. Um, and it's really amazing. So, you, like, you know, like I said, just go to Dun and Bradstreet and start typing some of these names in and you'll probably be pretty, pretty astonished. You know, getting back to what the media may or may not know, I think that there's people, especially in the major media, people like an Anderson Cooper or Wolf Blitzer or people like this. I think that they're at the very top and I think that they're in the know. I mean, most people realize and know that Anderson Cooper did spend some time interning with the CIA when he was going through school. Um so it would not be out of the realm of possibilities that, you know, a lot of these in the know news media celebrities know exactly what's going on. And you're right. You know, you have these big events, that, you know, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School has 3000 students, but they keep interviewing the same 10. You know, we see them over and over and over. And I've even seen videos where a reporter will start to interview one student and they'll be waved off. No, we don't want to talk to that student. Let's talk to this student. So it's very compartmentalized. And what you got to remember is that the media and our government is counting on the fact that this is that you're going to have an emotional response to these incidents. They're very emotionally driven, especially a school shooting. What could be more emotionally driven than the loss of lives of of children and teenagers? So immediately they're sucked into that emotional response. So what I ask people to do is step away from that emotional response and start using your critical thinking and your rationality and your common sense to start looking at these events and listen closely to what these People are describing and the way that they're describing it, and you'll find out that, you know, what what they're saying just doesn't doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It just it just would not be possible. And can I jump in here and ask you to comment on something? Recently I sent you some footage that was on Live Leak and it was the um, San Isidro nineteen eighty four. San Isidro is south of San Diego, it's the last border town before Mexico. It was the McDonald's shooting. And mm-hmm. You analyzed that and you pointed out a lot of things that are missing at these capstone exercises. Would you go over some of those? Sure. So this this so this shooting occurred at a McDonald's and it was 1980, wasn't it? I believe it was 80 or early 80s. But what you see in that footage is exactly what you don't see in footage currently. And you saw bodies strewn all around. There were like 21 people killed in this McDonald's. And what you, you you see bodies contorted, you see pools of blood, and the way that these bodies have are are lying and the way that they're contorted, it's unnatural. Um, meaning that if someone were just plain acting or plain to be dead, they could not hold these positions. It would be impossible. 
Um, what you see in the pooling of blood is un- unlike blood that we see at a lot of these events that just stays bright red. After a period of time, as it's exposed to the air, the blood oxygenates and it starts to turn a, a, a light brown and then a darker brown. And that's exactly what we see in this event at this at this at this McDonald's in 1980. And that's exactly what you don't see there. So, you know, you you compare and contrast what we can assume is an actual bona fide event where several people are killed and compare that. To whether, you know, what, what we're seeing lately, whether it's Parkland, whether it's Orlando, whether it's the Texas shooting, Las Vegas, all of these. And it's, it's just, it's just not realistic. But, but again, what has happened with, with the media is they've just deluged just with, 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 with these incidents over and over and over that this is naturally what we think that we're supposed to see. But it's not, you know, if you see blood and it's been there for, an hour or two hours and, and on, it's going to start to turn dark. It's not going to stay a bright red. And this is what we saw, especially at the Boston bombing. Initially, we saw no blood at all. And then just miraculously, this bright red blood appears. What well, it, it came out of tubes. It came out of these bags. And, and, and what happened is you had the initial explosion. There was no blood. And then you see all this that looked like literally red paint. And you cannot have arms and legs and limbs blown off and they're not simultaneously be be blood it, it, it would just be immediate so you know these are some of the things that that we really need to start looking for and start using our our common sense and our critical thinking i'd like to add that looking at the officer peeling these i think they're the triage tarps off the victims First of all, there was a very different air. You could even tell from the film footage or the video footage that this was different from what we see on in these other more modern events. You saw the people in weird positions and they were lying in what looked like black tar. That was the blood. And you also, if you observe the behavior of the police officer or whoever he was pulling that yellow tarp back, he was somber. There was something very, very different about watching that. You knew that this was a mass casualty event with lots of bodies lying there and that it was real. And you don't get that sense from the footage that we see in these more modern uh, crises. The other incident that comes to mind for me is the the North Hollywood shootout from about 20 years ago. Remember these, these, I think there were two guys that were in full body armor? Yeah, with the automatic weapons. With the automatic weapons. And, And I remember in that event where the police were being wounded and shot, that to me didn't look like acting. And maybe you guys might disagree with me, but I remember it looking very, very realistic. I mean, do you recall that, Alex? Do you recall that particular incident? And do you remember it looking more real than what we're seeing today? I do. I've not researched it in depth, but just going by what I remember, yes, it, it, it did seem real. The the police knew that they were outgunned. Um, right. they, there, was a, uh, there was a gun shop in the area, and they were running to the gun shop because they needed heavier firepower. Um, and you had... I know you had at least one officer that was wounded and they were showing him. He looked like he was very much in distress. He was trying to hide behind a tree from keeping from getting shot again. Right. Um, that did look real to me again. I had, I, I've not studied it in depth, but that, but that does to me look like it may have been an actual true event. Well, the reason I bring that up is because is that something that was orchestrated or engineered to happen? And in that case, casualties were real casualties were part of the plan. Whereas today, you know, it's a question mark as to whether there are real casualties or not. I guess what I'm saying, folks, is that I can go back to some of these other events and I can look back at them and I can say, okay, it it certainly does look real because we're looking at footage. It doesn't look choppy. It doesn't look like somebody's running around with a shaky phone camera and, and all that. I remember the North Hollywood shootout where, I mean, they were right on it, and we were watching it unfold. And whereas with this stuff, everything is after the fact. We get all of this canned, processed 
footage that gets handed to the public afterwards. And all the major media outlets are handing out essentially the same pictures in the same video. If you get footage at all, because even uh, with this Parkland shooting, the, you know, Sheriff Israel has said that he doesn't know if he'll ever release the video of right. the shooting. So, you know, we, we have no proof that a shooting actually took place. And, you know, I'm, I'm not willing to say 100% that, that, that there's nobody killed or shot in this event, but I've not yet seen any verifiable proof that I can look at and say, oh, well, yeah, it looks like somebody did get shot because in all these, I mean, in Vegas, you had the same thing. You know, there's no video of Stephen Paddock carting all these weapons and ammunition into his hotel room. There's no video of him going through the casino. And, you know, as, as we said, I think in the last one that we did during Vegas that, you know, the, it's, it's the most heavily surveyed city in the country. If, you know, if not the world, it should be videotape all over the place. We got no video from Sandy Hook, got no video from Vegas. You know, we got no, we get, we're getting no video from, from Parkland. So, you know, this is, this is a trend. It's, it's, it's something that we're seeing in, in all of these events. And, you know, what we get are a handful of, um, cell phone video, usually not very good video, and where it's, you know, it can be hard to tell exactly what's going on. And, you know, I've I, I've seen some of the video, you know, from, from the Parkland shooting that I don't think is genuine, and we can talk about that a little later. You know, it's and it's just the same thing. They, they never deviate from the script. They just keep doing the same thing event after event. And, you know, going back to looking at these on an emotional level, um, you know, there's there's a logical fallacy known as appeal to popular sentiment, which which means that if the news is telling us it happened and the government's telling us that it happened and everybody else seems to seems to believe it, then it must be true. And that's what's known as appeal to popular sentiment. But what you got to do is you have to turn that around and you have to go by inference to the best explanation, meaning given this set of circumstances, what the government's told us compared to what we find that looks inconsistent, is it more probable that this event happened as we were told by the media and government, or is it more probable that it happened another way and we're being lied to? A couple of weeks ago, I was talking to a friend from Los Angeles, and I was mentioning to her about these capstone exercises, trying to explain as briefly as I could that there is an unfolding going on in this country, and that the school shootings and the these car incidents and trucks that mow a bunch of people down are an exercise or staged events. And she said, "Oh no, no, no!" She said, "I was." I was present at where there was at the Santa Monica farmer's market where a car ran a bunch of people down. And I said, really? And I was trying to think, when was that? What do I know about that? And she told me, I said, what did you see? She said, well, my friend and I were going to the farmer's market and we went into a store. And when we came out, there were all these people lying on the sidewalk and there were bodies and there were people who were badly injured and just lying there. And this car had come right through the farmer's market and mowed down booths and people. And I said, well, I'm going to have to look that up. So I did. And this happened in 2003, I found out. It was an 86-year-old man driving who lost control of his car and plowed through the Santa Monica farmer's market. And I called her back and I said, you know what? That one probably was real. Because in these other events, it's not somebody of that age to start with, it's usually either a Muslim or somebody who is said to be mentally ill with some kind of, you know, resentful hate agenda, right? Mm -hmm. So yep. that was much earlier. And I said, these driver um, car truck events are all for the purpose of pushing driverless cars. And back in 2003, we didn't really ever even think of driverless cars. So that would have been, especially the way she described it. And she also said that the police were there and the police kept asking her and her friend, what did you see? What did you see? And they were very intently pressing for information. And that's not the sense that I get in these events. The police are not pressing for information. No, that's right. And that's the thing, right? The thing is that there are real events that take place in this situation with the farmer's market and an 86-year-old man that lost control of his car. These things do happen. But the question I want to ask you, Sophia, is we have this whole commerce and contract situation, the whole capstone event 
approach to this. How come they're able to get away with it? How is it that they're able to skirt what many people would say, hey, how are they able to avoid prosecution for doing what they're doing? Because clearly they're inciting fear, they're inciting all kinds of uh, civil unrest and disruption. How do they get away with it? Well, I think one of the main reasons why, and some of your listeners may be aware of this, we used to have a uh, a statute known as the Smith-Munt Act of 1948. And the Smith-Munt Act precluded the United States from using techniques of propaganda within the continental United States and United States territories as we were using abroad. Um, a lot of times we use propaganda against the Soviet Union or East Germany during the Cold War. Um, but it made it illegal to use propaganda, especially on a grand scale, as we're seeing now, against the American public. Well, in 2012, that the Smith-Munt Act was nullified by the National Defense Authorization Act, or the NDAA, that Obama signed in 2012. So President Obama signed the NDAA in 2012, and then, boom, what did we start seeing in 2013? We saw Sandy Hook. We saw the Boston bombing. We saw Orlando. We're seeing all these events. So now – Having propaganda against the American public is quote unquote legal. It's legal for them to do. And that's one of the reasons that they're, that they're getting away with it. Okay. So is the, the sole objective here to invoke a police state? Because people are going to ask, well, what is the actual bottom line? What does the goal line look like with regard to why they're doing this and how it all ends? Mike, I think that there is a, change agenda on the books and it can only be done through contracts remember that that was what lies at the very bottom of this so when you have that parent andrew pollock remember andrew pollock you posted it on your blog yep. like, talking to trump yes he was the father of meadow pollock said to have been killed in this event and he is pumping his fist in the air saying we need to fix the schools we need to get together with the president and fix the schools and if he's not going to do it i'm going to do it and he mentioned how he had been in an elevator that day which had a security guard in it and he wanted to know why this wasn't the case at the schools so that's what they are getting ready to install they want a police force, law enforcement, mental, slash mental health presence in the schools in the form of proctors and trained personnel, I'll just put it that way, to enforce control over the students. They want the students of the next generation to get used to seeing uniformed people in their schools observing them. And this is fixing the schools, bringing the military presence into children's lives, right? right? So how do you fix the schools? Well, you have to apply for grants and money to do so. In the case of Sandy Hook, the elementary school was torn down and a big, huge one is being put up in its place. There, there was a massive grant for that. And you can bet your boots that... This high school, which is said to have been torn down, is going to be replaced by the template high school for America with this military presence in it, just as Sandy Hook will be the template elementary school. Now, a Rockefeller tenant, I just learned, what is to make the highest peaks higher. And this Broward County Sheriff's Department is supposedly the third largest in the country, right after NYPD and Los Angeles County sheriffs. So that's a high peak. So the idea is if you're going to want to expand something and make it impressive and a model or a template for the rest of the country, don't pick a small, uh, you know, podunk town with a tiny, rickety little police force. Take something big and make it bigger. Endow it with grant money. Create an event around it to set the precedent for, to call for the expansion and the strengthening of this new kind of environment, which is basically New World or Order. So they're going after the minds of the young people, right? That's what they want to capture. They want to capture the minds of the young people. They want to condition them. They want to indoctrinate them to become accustomed 
to this type of environment, a, a, a police state environment, a lockdown type of environment where you always have to be in fear of something. Something bad could be lurking around the corner. So you need the authority. You need the police departments. You need the paramilitary. You need your politicians to protect you. So if you want to be safe, then you need to understand, you need to accept this apparatus that we're, that, you know, we're going to build and that they, they are building. As, just as you said, Sophia, they're taking these schools down and, and then they're going to put up these state of the art surveillance centers, if you will, and they're going to call them schools. So this is going to be very disconcerting to many, many people that are listening to this show because, you know, it, what it really says is that the entire system from bottom to top or top to bottom is completely corrupt and it is completely anti-humanity, anti-freedom, liberty, and all that stuff. So what are your thoughts on that, Alex? Am I wrong? No. You know, to further comment on that, you know, we might think that, that you know, this is egregious behavior on the, pa on the on the part of people who that, you know, who are supposed to be be, quote unquote, caring for us or making sure that that we're safe. But see, this is this has been a rather slow process and they're speeding it up. But the young people, that's that's how they're going to grow up. So they're just going to be used to it. So for them to go to school and to have armed police officers in tactical gear it's it's just going to be something natural also you got to remember that they use you know the the classic hegelian dialect the problem reaction solution um whereas they're creating this problem the reaction is oh my gosh we need to do something so this and so they provide the you know they'll come in and provide the the solution you know i've told people before let's let's look at Facebook or smartphones or um, other social media, if the government came to you and said, Mike, what we'd like to do is we'd like to monitor your life. We want to know who your friends are. We want to know where you're going. We want to know what you like, what you don't like, um, what restaurants you want to go to. Um, most people are going to say, I don't want that kind of intrusion in my life. But, you know, you put it out in the form of Facebook. Everybody does it. Right. And. If you go and do a little research on on Facebook, you know they got their startup funding by the from from the CIA. They got like six hundred million dollars from the CIA to help fund Facebook. Um, so here's a kid like Mark Zuckerberg who is literally a college dropout, and now he's a multi billionaire because he came up with this with with this great idea. But you know things like Facebook. I mean that's that's all they are is they're just gathering information on on people, which is you know just another reason why I don't have Facebook. But another thing we keep at, you know, a lot of people are very, you know, they they don't want to believe that this stuff is going on. And their first question is always, why? Why would they do that? Well, you got to get away from the why and look at they are doing it. You know, we can go back and we can research the exact why later, but you can't discount the fact that that it's happening. An analogy I heard somebody give that that, that was very good it was it would be like a homicide detective walking into the scene of there's 10 murders on the floor. And that would be like the homicide detective going, well, I don't see a motive. So this didn't happen. I'll tell you why they're doing this. It's because there's no money in peace and quiet. All these departments want something to do. They want expansion. They want a new hospital. They want new this, new that, more dogs, a tank, a bomb squad. And this is how they get more money is through exercises because there's no money in peace. That's what all the anti-war activists were pointing out years and years ago. Well. Again, it's going to be very alarming and it's disconcerting, Sophia. I mean, and I know you know this and, and um, Alex knows this, but because people are going to ask the question, well, where the hell are the good guys? Where are they? The wagons are circled by all the bad guys. Mike, do you remember Bohemian Grove, the cremation of care ceremony? Yes, of course. Yeah. Well, the good guys are at the low end of the pyramid. And the more disagreeable and unreasonable you are, I was watching a Jordan Peterson video. I started to develop an interest in what he has to say. He's a psychologist. These are the people who get to the top, the surly, unfriendly, authoritative, intimidating people. Now, the people who 
At 10 Bohemian Grove are the top level. They're the all-seeing eye, the all-knowing in their respective corporations. And they perform annually a ceremony called cremation of care. And that's what is operating in all these expansion exercises, all commerce and contracts, is cremation of care. You have no obligation to Joe Public. You are a corporate officer, and your number one concern is profit through commerce and contracts. There's no money in peace. You can't expand. You'll never get retirement. You'll never get a bonus. You'll never get a promotion if everything is just lollygagging because people want to be left alone and do their own thing. Okay, so we're back to the old power and control thing here, right? I mean, really, at the end of the day, they, they want to maintain their power. They want to maintain their control. And the way they're doing it is is by force. It, it's through fear and violence, propaganda. I mean, it's really very twisted, you know? And I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but the more we talk about this, where do you go with this stuff? I guess what I'm asking is... and. Uh, Alex, I'll ask you to jump in. I mean, are we actually talking to ourselves? I mean, is there any hope that we're going to be able to get this thing shaped and molded, at least to some degree, where we don't have this nonsense taking place on like a, a monthly basis? I mean, are we talking to ourselves? Well, to an extent, we are. And there are more and more people who are – I heard Max Egan, somebody – made the comment to Max Egan that it seems like more and more people are waking up. And he made the comment, it's not so much people are waking up, there's more people starting to understand. Yeah, um, that was with me. Oh, was it? I'm sorry. Yeah. It was with Mike Williams. <laughs> That's okay. Um, <laughs> but, you know, this particular event in Parkland is interesting because we know that, you know, they're, they're, they're shutting stuff down. You know, they're, they're shutting different – content providers down and they don't want the message to get out because I think this is the first event where we see a tipping point because before in stuff like Sandy Hook and Vegas and Orlando, it was people like us, you know, people, old, older people who were calling this out and saying, you know, this doesn't look right to me. But now, well, now you have millennials who are now jumping on board and saying, no, nah, there's something fishy about this. And so, and that's and to me, that's a good sign. You know, when you have the millennials who, you know, we all assume are just sitting around eating Tide Pods, as they say, you know, when you when you have the younger generations actually starting to question things, I think that scares them a little bit because, you know, they they have to get the young people. And if the young people are starting to have an awakening to this, and I think that's the reason that. You know, you're seeing a lot more censorship is because these younger generations are, are are climbing on board and they're very, very Internet savvy and they talk to their friends and they Snapchat and they Instagram. Um, so, you know, this is I think this is maybe driving a little bit of a, a wedge in the controllers and what it is that they want to do. So to me, that's a good sign. And but, you know, it's it's. Unfortunately, I think, you know, we're going to see more and more events because they have to keep us in a state of fear, for one thing. Um, they have to keep us occupied. And it's not just, and I may have mentioned this in our last talk, but it's, you know, it's not, it's not just these big shootings and these big events that they're staging. They're staging things all over the place in every city across the country, whether it be a plane crash or, or helicopter crash or a fire or something like that. I find so many times if, as I look into it, this is totally fake. They've just completely made this up. I'd like to mention that all of those events that you've just drawn our attention to are expansion opportunities in all different kinds of settings and scenarios. And that's what everybody wants. Everybody wants a new this, a bigger that. And they apply for government money to do so. There are, There is a vying and competition. They're scattered all over the country because the federal government is peppering these opportunities across every state. And they're giving the cities a chance to compete for this kind of upgrading and expansion through the grant money. And let's remember that the money is borrowed from the international banks and it can be borrowed ad infinitum. The, and it gives everybody stuff to do. 
Everybody is kept busy expanding, rebuilding, re-legislating, controlling, and they want to control the free people as much as they possibly can. That's at the bottom of it. That's at the heart of it. So they can standardize us, get our beliefs all collated into a unithink, and then, you know, punish us for any kind of divergence or individuality. Yeah, it's a good point you guys are making because we talk about the shootings, but we also have to look at other events, right? So I don't know whether you guys agree with this or not, so I'm going to put it out there. And if you don't agree, just say, Mike, I think you're out in left field. But we have the shootings. Yes, we have that. But then we had the fires out in California, which looked very, very strange to me. I mean, those fires did not look like natural fires to me. Again, it, it calls into play disaster capitalism and there were some researchers that called out the fact that these fires took place in Agenda 21 hotspots. Uh, we had the uh, the supposed Hurricane Harvey down in Texas where people came back and said, people who were doing research, that it wasn't really quite a hurricane. It was a torrential downpour for hours on end. So, you know, not to get like too tinfoil hat here, but is it possible that these things too, let's say these hurricanes, like Hurricane Harvey, we have the fires out in California, of course, the shootings we all know about, that these are all part and parcel of an agenda. In other words, they have different tools in their toolbox in order to um, to be able to benefit and profit from these disasters. And then thus, like you said, Sophia, to be able to rebuild and to maintain their, their control. To increase their control and to make us, you know, roll up like little roly-poly bugs and turn to them and say, save us, save us. Well, what are we going to do now? Look at this fire. Look at this flood. Look at this damage. I mean, they're actually emptying people's pockets. The people in Northern California who lost their houses still owe on the mortgage. And guess what? Somebody asked me the other day, well, why, why won't they rebuild? Why can't they rebuild? Well, you know why? Because that's another financing of a house. Who can afford two houses? right? On their backs. Right. That Then the consolation prize for all this will be, oh, well, so you've lost your house. You can't pay off the mortgage or you're going to be stuck with that the rest of your life. You can't rebuild. Well, here, we have smart housing. We're building it downtown. It has a movie theater on the street level and Whole Foods, and you can live there. And it's going to be small and compact and everything will be provided. All these services Right next door, it's not that you won't need a car. You'll just ride your bike or walk. And that's Agenda 21. Those are the smart cities. So I think that they want to redesign, re-sculpt the whole world. And they're doing it by their commerce and contracts. Yeah, and I think that the big problem is, is that people, generally speaking, I mean, there are those of us that see what's going on. We see the quote-unquote bigger picture. But most people are in little buckets, right? So they look at the shooting and they do not connect the dots with the fires in California or they don't connect the dots with flooding taking place down south. And in other words, they take look at each thing if they're looking at each thing. Sometimes they don't look at anything and they're not putting it together. So there's a, a big game plan that these controllers have. And they have many, many facets and variables, tools at their disposal in which to push their agenda forward. Again, you know, it's it's something that I really wish by people listening to sh this show and uh, other shows uh, like ours, where we talk about this stuff, to start to really get acclimated toward what is going on and how reality really works. And that there are people that control, that there are puppet masters. You know, it's not each person walking around, wandering around aimlessly, just kind of functioning and walking through life. There's a controlling apparatus, there's a controlling mechanism that is just manipulating and, and, and steering people in a general direction. And, you know, sometimes people will think, well, it's too broad to be able to do that. But if you take a step back and you take a look at where we are today versus where we were 50 or 60 years ago, we're going through the funnel. I'm sorry to say. It is very progressive. And I want to ask Alex what he thinks of this, but I noticed it was on a Pockets of the Future video and he was commenting on the David Hogg being coached while delivering his lines, that video. And he made a very 
important observation. He said, this had to have been leaked deliberately to bait us. Right. And a lot of people commented on that video and immediately it started, a, you know, dominoes falling of YouTube channels getting scrubbed. And that is how they train us. There's a trend setting here. They give us bait. A lot of people comment and then they scrub YouTube of people's channels who have commented on this. So, yes, it's true that millennials are speaking out more, but I think that's also a trend that was deliberately created so that those millennial, millennials will be trained not to speak out quite so much because their wrist will be slapped. They'll lose their YouTube channel or their Facebook account. Yeah, I think there's some validity to that. You know, when that um, excerpt of David Hogg practicing his lines came out, I thought, you know, I did think that was a little fishy because it's from CNN and for CNN to leak their own video, they either have to have, you know, a disgruntled person at CNN who wanted to get that out or it was put out on, on purpose. And it likely was because, you know, these people that, that plan these, these organizations that plan these things, they will definitely play both sides of the equation, um, to get, people infighting between themselves and in and, and with each other and to just add further confusion. Um, so, yeah, it's not out of the realm of possibility at all for that to have been deliberately put out there, even though it's clear that he's being coached because that is not the natural behavior of someone who is just involved in a, in a traumatic event. I mean, people just don't act like that. They don't need to, if you're involved in a, in an event like that, you don't need to rehearse what you saw. You know, you, you just tell what you saw. And even if people stammer as, as to what they saw, that just makes them more believable. If it's genuine, you know, you don't stop and say, Hey, wait, uh, let's reshoot that. Yeah. I saw that, uh, Paul Romano, uh, Pockets of the Future video, and he did make a very good point. The one thing that I noticed, though, Sophia and, and Alex, with that video where he was being coached, he, David Hogg did appear to be frustrated at points. Uh, the, the facial expression looked like somebody was like, oh, yeah, I screwed up my line again or I screwed up my delivery again. So I don't know. I, I do believe that they do bait the alternative research community. There's no question about it. I have made a point that I also believe they bait the truth community with the people died, people didn't die debate so that it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's like a tennis game, just volleying over the net back and forth. And as that's being debated, whether people died or not, what's happening is the, the mechanism, the machinery that is pushing the agenda forward continues to roll on while people in the alternative research community are sitting there and throwing rocks at each other about whether somebody died or not. What, what's your take on that? I mean, do you think it's something that is worth focusing on? Or my take on it is, is that you know, I don't want people to die, but I think it's more important that we look under the hood and understand who actually is involved with orchestrating and engineering these events. Sophia, what, what do you think of that? I honestly, at this point, wouldn't know if people died unless I was there. That's where I stand. And that's a safe statement. But the reality is there I don't think they're going to knock people off in an exercise, honestly, but I can't get out there and scream from the rooftops unless I saw with my own eyes what happened. So all we can do is conjecture, Mike, based on logic, right? Right. And that's what Alex said before. There was a term that he used. Inference to the something, most likely scenario or something inference, like that. Inference to the best explanation. In other words, you know, we've we've not seen any credible video of anyone being shot, um, anyone dying. That's not to say, you know, I'm again, I'm not saying 100 percent that nobody was died or shot here. But you have in all of these interviews, look at how many people have said, well, they told us told us that there was going to be a drill sometime this year. And we had a drill earlier in the day. And they told us at some point that they would be coming into the school and firing blanks and dressed in tactical gear. And that's exactly what people were explaining. And look back at all these shootings. Almost all of these were preceded by a drill. Um so, you know, it, again, it's, 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 
it's taking all of these little things and looking at them and say, you know, if this was a truly organic event, you know, we wouldn't have a drill right before something that supposedly went went live. And we wouldn't have all these little coincidences, you know, taking place that really can't be explained and no one has an explanation, an explanation for. Like like one of those is that Nicholas Cruz, the the, the supposed shooter, supposedly hired an Uber to take him to the school. And then you have people describing him in full tactical gear. Well, did he haul an AR-15, a duffel bag full of ammunition, a bulletproof vest and tactical gear and the Uber driver not notice? Right. You know, oh, it looks like maybe you're going to shoot up a school. Um, you know, n the Uber driver has not been identified. Nobody has talked to him. It was just, oh, yeah, he took an Uber. And people forgot about that, and, and and nobody questions it. And then you look at the timing of the event. Why did this play take, take place? What else was going on? And these things, I think they plan these things out months or years in advance. If something, if X happens, then Y is the answer. You know, why is the school shooting? And so, for instance, in this particular shooting, what what was happening? Well. The democratic narrative of Russian collusion was was falling apart. It's completely discredited. Um, um, at the same time, you had an, in the Florida legislature, uh, le legislature on the very day of the shooting, there was a bill, a concealed carry bill that was that they were going to strengthen their concealed carry law, um, and they obviously didn't want that. Um, this just happened to take place. A half hour, 45 minutes away from Mar-a-Lago, which is Trump's, you know, Florida home that he goes to all the all the time. So that's quite a coincidence. The person who's the school's named after, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, um, she was a reporter and author and activist, you know, and she was Beth no best known for her effort efforts against draining the Florida Everglades. So she was against draining the swamp. What does Trump want to do? Trump wants to drain the the drain the swamp. Where did it take place? It took place in Parkland. Well, what, where we heard Parkland before? Where Parkland was the hospital where Kennedy was, was pronounced dead. Right. Um, it took place in the district of Debbie Wasserman Schultz. You know, Debbie Wasserman Schultz has been very, very much involved in, or, in, and said to be involved in, in the corruption within the, the DNC and the possible, you know, offing of, um, Seth, Seth Rich. Rich. And yeah. so, you know, you have all these things and even Nicholas, Cruz. I mean, if you take his name, Nicholas Jesus Cruz or Jesus. OK, so Jesus is his middle name. Cruz translated means cross. He was arrested by Israel. So you have Cruz arrested by Israel and he's sent to the cross to be crucified in the media. I mean, you, you, and, you know, you listen to these things. People think, oh, you're, that's just a coincidence. Well, there are so many of them. Um, you know, those are just a few. I could go on. But. Cruz itself, you know, you have Senator Ted Cruz and his father, Rafael Cruz, is seen in a photograph along the JFK motor route and is also pictured with Lee Harvey Oswald and and a, a few months before the assassination in New Orleans, handing out fair play for Cuba pamphlets. So, you know, there's speculation that he was probably possibly involved, you know, in with within the fringes of the JFK assassination. Um, Nicholas Cruz was said to have gone to Walmart. After the shooting, well, we're also told that Walmart went on complete lockdown. They didn't let anybody in and, and anybody out. So how did Cruz get in or out of Walmart? Then he went to McDonald's. And how many times have we seen McDonald's used in in these shootings? There was a McDonald's in this one. There was a McDonald's um, used. There was a shooting in Germany where it was in right in front of McDonald's. If you go through, you'll find out that McDonald's, Nike, we see these Nike shoes everywhere. So you have these corporate. You, it's like these these events have actual literal corporate sponsors. It's it, yeah, commercials. Sure. Yeah, yeah, and Nike, of course, just do it right. That's their uh, their tagline. Uh -huh. Now, Alex, let me ask you this question. Uh, I have two questions for you because. Um, I picked up on two things. It's two videos that I saw. Hopefully you saw them also. Um, the one was with that one teacher. She was a uh, creative or she is a creative arts teacher. And she's the one who said that she, she saw the shooter mm -hmm. and he was decked out in full body armor. And right. she said, what are the police doing here? 
That's what she thought. So, and then she pointed to her arm and said that, you know, she was, she was winged with a bullet. And I, I looked at the video and there was a mark on her left arm. I don't know, you know, if it, it's, it's, it's a real mark from a winged bullet. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But the reason why I bring her up is because two things. One, of all the people that they brought on television, she, to me, appeared to be one of the more sincere. And she may not be, but to me, she seemed sincere. The other thing is there was another shooting in San Bernardino where the exact same description of shooters in full body armor. And I think in San Bernardino, they said there were three. Right. Right. Three. Mm -hmm. So this is very interesting to me. So did you see that video of that teacher? And if you did, what was your take as a, as a police officer when you were watching her, that she seemed to come across as sincere to you? She does come across as sincere, but there's a couple of things in that video. Okay, so she goes out and she describes this person being in full metal. You know, what's this? What's this police officer doing here in full metal garb with a rifle I've never seen before? Now, I thought that was a very strange thing for her to say with a with a rifle that I've never seen before. Now, why would you? I mean, most people are used to this. you either see a rifle or you don't. So that that could tell me several things. One, it could tell me that that wasn't an actual bona fide rifle. It's it could have been what we call a, a sim gun or a simunition gun that fires uh, plastic pellets. They sting when they hit you, but they don't cause any damage. Um, but they are different looking. A lot of times they'll be different colors, like an orange or, or a, a bright blue or sometimes a bright pink. So they don't look like a rifle that you've seen before. Um, it could have been an actual paintball gun that was firing red paintballs that she could have seen. But more than anything else was her demeanor and her mannerisms when she talked. And why I say that is because she describes pulling students into the room and two students were shot and killed in her classroom. And by her own words, these were her two favorite students, but she shows no emotion over it. Um, I've interviewed a lot of people who have been involved in traumatic events, either shootings, um, stabbings, um, sexual assaults, and almost without fail, when they're telling me what happened, they'll have what I call a moment of reflection where they'll, they'll pause because they're reliving it in their mind and they'll either tear up or they'll cry or they'll clench their fists or they'll grit, grit their teeth, but they're reliving that moment. She never relives that moment. But yet these were two precious students that, in in fact, she kind of goes into a kind of little bit of a somber part during her interview. She got emotional at one point, but it was after she had described the two students getting shot and then she got emotional. She did not get emotional while she was talking about it. And that's what I picked up on. Right. And but right after she got emotional, it, she just switched. And just started talking about it again. And then she started describing the person in the hall across from her, the Scott Beagle, who if we take a look, a closer look at Scott Beagle. So when this happened, I started looking, I went online to the Florida Department of Education, and started looking at for teachers teaching, certi- teaching certification. When I first looked at Scott Beagle, it was completely blank. There was no teaching certification for Scott Beagle. I checked it again a few days later and lo and behold, there's his teacher certification and a certification for him being the cross country coach. So he had an athletic certification as well, but it was completely blank when I first looked at it. And this was a day or two after the event. Um, so then I come to find out that apparently Scott Beagle used to teach at that school, but he left in 2012 and went back to, he had previously been in New York. He went back in New York and now apparently there's also photographs of him after the shooting and he's in a synagogue in New York. And these were taken after the shooting. So by her saying, you know, Scott Beagle was in the hall across from her, uh, by my research, now I I could be proven wrong, and that's possible. But from what I've found so far, Scott Beagle left Florida in 2012. So, you know, that's – and that's that's the big thing that we look at. We we look at people's emotions, how they respond. Um, I did an armed robbery investigation one time in a parking garage – and there were several employees. The employees were having a meeting, and there was about seven or eight of them, and they were mostly female. There were, I think, two or three male employees in there. And somebody came in. They were armed with the, the guy and his partner came in. One of them was was armed with a gun and was threatening to shoot and kill people unless they gave him the money. They gave him the money. They recognized that it was probably a former employee of the garage, which it turned out to be. 
But so I'm interviewing these people and all of them are just they're they're shaken. Um, and even, you know, even talking to them afterwards, you know, a couple of days after they still have that, you know, they stop and reflect, you know, they would be talking and they, and they would stop and say, man, I could have been shot. Man, that was so scary. He could have shot me. Um, but, you know, you you watch these interviews and and you don't see any of that. Um, so this is one of those keys when I say, you know, take the emotion out of it and start looking at it rationally and start using your your critical thinking skills. There was also a video. I don't know if you saw this video, but it was supposedly taken by a student inside the classroom as the shooting was going on. And if you listen to the sound of the gunfire, um, I have degrees in music, too. I'm not just a police officer. So I'm listening to this gunfire. And for one, it's too loud. It's too clear. And it's too close. The gunfire never, never moves like this guy's supposed to be moving down the hall or moving in, in, in and out of rooms. It's just consistent. I mean, it's so clear that you can actually hear the firing mechanism on the firearm. It's just absolutely too clear. So there's one of four things going on there. Okay, either that student was taking the video while firing blanks while he was filming, or someone was standing right next to him firing blanks while he was filming, or the sound of the gunfire was playing on a sound system while he was filming, or four, it was edited in afterward. But it's 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 just not realistic. And there's a second video of a of uh, students being evacuated from a classroom. I don't know if you saw this one, um, but. The students don't appear to be overly traumatized. You hear some screaming and some yelling and what sounds like some sniffling and crying. Um, you see a police officer um, carrying a female out of the room, but she appears to have absolutely no injuries whatsoever. Um, and you even have one student who's more concerned about her bottle of water. She even turns around and says, where's my bottle of water? You know, if you're in a situation like that, you're not going to be thinking about your bottle of water because what happens with the human brain is you lose all fine motor skills um, and because all you're thinking about, you're going into that fight or flight mode. All you're thinking about is surviving. You're thinking about nothing else. And that's that's the brains and the body's defense mechanism for self-preservation and for self-survival. You're not you're not going to be taking out. You probably aren't going to have the manual dexterity to pull your phone out and start making a phone call or that's that's not what you're thinking about. And during the midst of this shooting, going back to David Hogg, he's actually in a closet and he's filming and he's whispering, but he's the only one whispering. If you listen in the background, everyone's talking in a normal voice. But you hear David Hogg saying, we, we think this was a drill, but it's not a drill. It's real. And then he starts asking his teacher, what do you think should happen? Well, we need more gun control. This can't be going on. If you're in the midst of a shooting where you're in fear for your life, you're not going to be talking about gun control. You're, you're going to want to be quiet. You're going to be in fear for your life. You're going to be panicking. You're going to be crying. All you want to do is survive. And it's just ridiculous that these things are happening. And people, people need to start picking up on this and, 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 and viewing these things, again, using critical thinking and common sense reasoning. I have one more question I have for, for Alex of some footage I saw. It looks to be genuine where somebody had their phone out and they were filming these four police officers taking a very, very heavy bag and dumping it onto the back of the bed of a pickup truck. And it took two cops to pick that bag up to put it into the pickup truck. What do you think was going on there? Any thoughts? I don't know. They could have been they could have been moving equipment. It's really hard to say. It doesn't doesn't necessarily look like a body because here's the thing. Another comment was made by one of the students that as they were being evacuated, the military people told them not to look at the bodies that they had put covers on and thrown mats over. And my first question is, what's the military doing there? If this is an organic, the, the military wouldn't have had time to get there. And two, if you're moving bodies, you're you're destroying the crime scene. You know, right. you're always taught don't touch anything till the detectives get there, till the investigators get there. Keep everything, um, keep bodies in the placement where the where they fell, unless you know, unless it becomes a hazard to the officer or to the general public. You leave things alone. So, you know, if if they're pushing bodies under tables and stuff, then then they're contaminating the crime scene and they likely would not be doing that. They'd get in a lot of trouble for doing that. So I'm not sure what they were putting on on the truck. Um, 
but I, it would be doubtful if they were just loading a body in into a truck because that's that's definitely not protocol. Sophia, when we're talking about this teacher that said that she saw the uh, the shooter in the full body armor, how does she get looped into this? I mean, did, does she sign a contract to play this part? I mean, I'm assuming she's a real teacher at the school. You, I, I know you don't know for sure, but what are your thoughts on how does a person get approached to participate in something like this and then carry it out? You know, Mike, if there's an exercise taking place, you will see, again, this is that real-time documentation. You will see what looks like a shooter carrying a rifle that you have never seen before. And you might say odd things like that because you're not in a real situation, although you're in real time. And this reflects uh, what the doctors, the admitting doctors in the ER in Boston were writing down. They were trained ER doctors, and yet they were writing, you know, very generic things down because they were not seeing real wounds. They were writing gash in stomach or something like that. And you, normally, if you've ever typed medical records or looked at anybody's chart or any medical uh, files, trained personnel will use terms that they've been trained to use. They're not going to just use really generic terms like you or I would use unless they're looking at something that's very, very generic. And so this woman might have seen a scenario that she was being asked to describe in an interview, which was part of that real-time documentation, even though it wasn't a real scenario. That's the best I can do with that question. I could maybe answer that also. It could be we were told that they had had two or three weeks prior to this shooting. They had gone through an active shooter drill. In fact, there were a couple of students and a teacher that actually said the Secret Service came out and was was at the school and was changing the security protocols. Well, you know, first of all, the Secret Service is not going to visit there and change their security protocols. That's an advance team in anticipation of a possible presidential visit, which Trump did go to Parkland. I don't know if he went to the high school or not, but that's that's why the Secret Service would have been there. So, again, that's another clue. But it could have also been that during that drill or maybe another drill, they just went to some of these teachers and they said, Hey, we want to film some, you know, some real life scenarios and we want to interview teachers, you know, to maybe what to maybe what they saw. And again, you know, this teacher, she was a creative writing teacher, um, whether she has any acting experience, I don't know. So it could be that, you know, this may have been filmed in advance as as something for a for a training. It's 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 just really hard to tell. And it could be that, you know, maybe some of these people are called in and say, look, we're going to do this thing. We're going to hold, hold, hold this this training scenario, but you know what? Nobody's going to get hurt, but it's going to be, you know, as lifelike as we can make it. Again, this is one of those whys that we have to investigate later. Let's, let's go with what we do know because we know this and this and this and this is happening that doesn't match what they're telling us. Okay. So we know that there's something weird going on here, but that's another why that maybe we have to go back and, and look and analyze at a, at a later date and not, and, and not get hung up on. Now, Oli said to me that he believes that during these uh, the drills that they actually do what you were saying uh, Alex that they actually do interviews and stuff like that and then what they do is they intertwine the drill that happened let's say a few days or a couple of weeks before that gets kind of stitched together with actually the the event that gets brought up in the media presented in the media so you know it's it, it does get very convoluted because you don't know we don't know when these conversations are had or were had or right. So we don't know. Now, I, I know we've asked this question before. I've asked this question before, but maybe we have new listeners and I'm sure it's, it's on the minds of even people that have been listening to us. But once the person who's involved in this as a drill and nobody's going to get hurt, once they see this whole thing roll out the way it's rolling out in the media, why do you think it is that these folks don't step forward and go, hey, wait a minute, time out. That didn't happen. And by the way, when they interviewed me, that was three weeks ago. And this was all a simulation. And so I, 
I don't know what's going on now, but I had no part in this and I don't want any part of this. How come we don't see that? How come we don't see people stepping up to blow the whistle? I think part of it is they signed a contract or it could be that they signed a contract, but 3000 people didn't sign a contract. OK, we can pretty much be sure of that. I have seen a couple of videos. There's one video of a kid that's pointing out and I don't know how real it is. It seems genuine that he's pointing out um, that. He doesn't go to school with David Hogg. I don't, I, you know, I don't know what they're they're talking about. This kid's like 25 years old. They say he goes to my school. He does go to my school. They're even saying that he's my debate partner. I've never met this guy in my life. You know, there's there's that video. There's also a couple that have come out. Um, but yeah, yeah. By and large, and I think of course the mainstream media is going to keep a tight lid on that as best as they as best as best as they can. They aren't going to let that kind of information come out. And you'll also notice in um, especially in Vegas, we had a lot of people that were supposedly coming out and saying this is not how it happened, um, and then they would disappear or they would commit suicide. I don't necessarily think that happened, but I think that might be used as a scare tactic for other people who might come forward. So, the, so those other people think, ah, better not come forward because I don't want to get disappeared or get suicided or something like that. But, you know, it, it is a strange phenomenon. You know, we, you, you think that there would be more people coming out saying, Hey, you know, this is what really happened. I wish that I could answer that further. I can't. Now, the other thing that, that, you know, really amazes me is that how many kids are at that high school? Do we know? 3,000 approximately. 3,000. Yeah. So you figure there's 3,000 phones there, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So every kid's got a phone. And you're going to tell me that 3,000 kids or some subset of 3,000, let's just be conservative here. We see 2,000 of them didn't have their phones out, taking video, taking pictures, or making phone calls. Yeah. Now, like I said before, during – during the actual shooting, especially if you're in the midst of it, you probably aren't going to be thinking about your cell phone. But afterward, after it starts to call, because, I mean, some of these kids said that they were in their classroom for a couple of hours um, before they were before they came in and said, OK, let's go and, and, and were evacuated. So by that time, you know, your your anxiety level is down. You know, your adrenaline has, has come back to to somewhat normal. That's the time that you're going to, you know, and, and, and as you're walking out. You know, that's when you're going to turn your cell phones on. And so, yeah, we should see a lot more cell phone footage, a lot more. But we don't. And, you know, you also look at these students who claim to have been injured and the injuries that they describe are just, you know, they're not consistent with real life. Um, for instance, there's this girl named Maddie. I think her name's um, Maddie Wilford. And she was shot three times. First of all, she said that she was in Holocaust class. She just happens to mention, oh, I was in Holocaust class when I got shot. So she was shot in th three times in the abdomen, the chest, and the arm. And then less than two weeks later, she's given a press conference in the hospital. And she doesn't look like there's anything wrong with her. The doctor's saying that she's a fast healer because she's young and she's going to start back to school next week. And she's just been shot in the chest and the abdomen with an AR-15. Now, for people who aren't familiar with the AR-15 and what it fires, it fires a, it's, it's a, it's a 223 round or 5.56 round. It, it's, it's not a large caliber round. It's a small caliber round, but it's meant to travel at a high velocity. So your typical 55 grain high velocity AR-15 bullet is traveling at 3,200 feet per second. So it's designed for maximum impact. So when it hits bone, that bullet is designed to deflect and traverse through the body, and it creates an unpredictable path throughout the body. Um, so for this woman to say or this girl to say that she was shot in the abdomen and the chest and already be out of the hospital, it's, it, it's, it's just ridiculous. It wouldn't happen. She's lucky to even be alive. She would probably be dead. It probably in, in reality, two wounds like that from an AR-15 would have killed her on the spot. I think there's something else at play. And a long time ago, I learned about the felony murder rule, which is, I, I wrote a newsletter on this. Um, I don't know when it was, maybe a year ago. But the felony murder rule is such that if you participate, usually in a crime, in a, a crime that isn't a capital offense, but somebody is killed as a consequence of this crime, you become a capital offender yourself just by having participated. And I think that that 
comes into play in this larger contract making. I don't think that 3,000 people who are involved in these events sign contracts, but the people who are directly involved in an exercise definitely have a set of instructions and they're probably required to sign something to the effect that they are going to follow those instructions or act on their best judgment and training. And if they later learn that there were deaths, there were there was a mass casualty massacre in this event that they participated in, they're going to feel very, very concerned. They are going to possibly think that they failed their training protocols or they something could come back on them. And I think that's what keeps a lot of people quiet. They don't want ramifications. They don't want to be dragged into court because they were involved in something that ended up in the deaths of many people, as is being reported. Now, Sophia, shouldn't we also be seeing, you and I have talked about this, and, and you know, you've brought this to my attention, I guess, um, with Sandy Hook, and also, I guess, with Las Vegas. Shouldn't we be seeing wrongful death lawsuits? Absolutely. We should be seeing families who are hysterical, and many of these actions taken in the aftermath I mean, there were no subrogation claims after 9-11, meaning if there was faulty construction, the steel wasn't, you know, proper, and there were all these problems with the way the building was built, you would have a bunch of lawsuits. They're called subrogation lawsuits or subrogation claims, and there were none. And conveniently, on 9-11, you also had at Pier 34, or whatever it was, uh, FEMA having a training drill so they could nip to the location in, you know, prompt time. And these, if, if there's too much coincidence. There's too much what looks like a plan that was made ahead. Well, were there any wrongful death lawsuits with Sandy Hook? I, I don't recall any. I could be wrong. Do you know of any? I think there was one lawsuit filed. I don't know if it was a wrongful death, but I think one was filed and then ultimately it was dismissed. But again, you know, that's going back a long time. And that was our training. That was where we were cutting our teeth on looking at this critically, as Alex points out. And we had time. But now so many of these are flying all around the kitchen that it's literally like a food fight. You know, there's as soon as. Anyone who sticks with this uh, incident or mass casualty event is going to have to ignore developments that are coming down the road because it takes tenacity. You have to really apply yourself. It takes diligence to do this. And when you're being, you know, there's a swarm of these things around you, which one do you look at? Well, the reason why I bring it up is because I want the, the audience to become aware that these are the types of details that if they are going to look into it, that they need to look into. So it, it's stuff like this, these lawsuits and stuff that a lot of people don't know about, researchers don't know about to look for. So this is the stuff that, you know, we need to watch for. You don't see a lot of wrongful death lawsuits or lawsuits against the school or um, against the police or against the municipality. But what you do see are lawsuits against the gun manufacturers um, because that's one of the things that they want to do. They want to demonize the guns. So in Sandy Hook, you had a group of parents that were going after Remington um, for the makers of that particular AR-15 that supposedly Adam Lanza used. Um, so you see them suing the gun manufacturers, but – you know, logic dictates, you know, you, you've just lost your child. You know, you're, you're, you're angry. You're grieving. You know, why didn't the school protect this child? And, and that are, you know, those are the type of lawsuits that we would expect to see, but we don't. So let me, let me switch gears a little bit. Alex, I'll ask you, what do we know about the Hogg family? Have you, have you looked into that at all? Well, you know, it's very interesting. It, you know, there's a lot of speculation that David Hogg actually graduated from Redondo Shores High School in Redondo Beach, California, um, in 2015. Um, his father, who was formerly with the FBI, did, you know, he was stationed a lot in that area in California. He worked for the FBI in California. Um, you have this video that was taken by David Hogg last August on Redondo Beach of this 
friend of his that he was with that left this surfboard or boogie board on a trash can, which I guess is against the rules of on on the beach. I'm sure Sophia can can tell us more about that. But you have to ask yourself, why is this news? You know, why did they go to the trouble? Because some guy left a boogie board on a trash can. I mean, that's not newsworthy. Well, was it because this is how we introduced David Hogg to the public? Now, there is another video online, I don't know if you've seen it, of somebody who's debunking the 2015 graduation in California, who supposedly has last year's yearbook from Stoneman Douglas, and he turns to the page where David Hogg was a junior, and he shows you that picture. But that's the only picture that he shows. You know, he doesn't lift the book up and, like, like fan it out. Um, and my question is, you know, David Hogg, by all appearances, is a very popular kid. You know, he's he does he's in journalism, you know, he's in acting, he does this and that. So there should be several other pictures of him in, in, in that yearbook rather than just the one. And apparently, there's I'm not seeing them yet. I don't know if you guys have, but there's also other pictures from the actual Renando Shores graduation um, that shows him actually graduating. Um, and, um, I, I've not seen those myself. Um, I know that other researchers, credible researchers that I listen to have, have been saying that, that there are photos. I, I saw one of those photos and the only problem we have with these photos and you guys know this, right? Is we have to be always, always aware of Photoshop. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, uh, a very interesting character. And I agree with you, um, Alex, that, this whole thing with the, the boogie board on the trash can. And, and folks, just so you know, if you hadn't seen this, the situation was that his friend, not even him, had put a boogie board on top of a trash can on a beach in, um, out in California. And the, the lifeguard had come down and said, look, you got to take that boogie board off the trash can. And the, his friend started to get, you know, snitty and snappy with the lifeguard. In the meantime, Either David Hogg was either just standing there or filming this. There's a video of this. And it made the news out in L.A., out in California. And so I agree with you, Alex, 100 percent. In this in this news piece, they never interviewed the lifeguard. They didn't interview the kid who owned the boogie board. It was David Hogg that was the spokesperson for what went on. Yeah, now, it's very odd. I don't live very far from the coast. And I've been to the beach plenty of times in North Carolina, and I can tell you right now that if somebody put a boogie board on top of a trash can and had some – cross some words with the lifeguard, it would not be on the 6 o'clock news. It wouldn't be in the newspaper. It's just a non-event. I have been at California beaches for many, many years now, and you don't see lifeguards talking to people like that. Lifeguards are trained. They're actually considered part of law enforcement. And that was an older lifeguard from what I saw. And they never talk to people like that. So I think there's an undercurrent of mental illness going here. You know, they want to. I think that whole thing was staged as well. And I do too. it's very possible. And they want this confrontation to reflect impro improper um, behavior on the part of the lifeguard because they're starting a people grab and they are looking for all kinds of reasons to draw people into custody which, which decisions are going to be made by police because those are the people who go and get you and then once you're in custody a they will have you examined by experts and they've got all kinds of experts on hand now and training more every day and then so you can have a list of symptoms fabricated by these experts, and you're never going to have anything to counter that with. They can say, you did this, you did that in their custody. So there's a tremendous opportunity here to start classifying and categorizing people based on behavior that they haven't even demonstrated. So where do you think that – what does that lead to, Sophia? So in other words, they, they take somebody in, they say they're not – mentally right in the head, and this is being done by people who really aren't trained to be able to make that evaluation, what, what happens after that? I mean, are, are they put away? Or are they uh, are they told they have certain rights taken away? I mean, what, what, where do you think it goes? One of the things we have to keep in mind is that 
Mental illness is not a biological disease. It's a matter of somebody's opinion. And mental illness, there's no diagnostic test for mental illness, just as there is no diagnostic test for autism. Mental illness, here's, here's the difference between a bona fide illness or disease and a mental illness. It only takes one person to have a disease. It takes at least two people to have a mental illness because that person has to be diagnosed by somebody. Now, I could have cancer. It may go undiagnosed officially, but that doesn't mean I still don't have cancer. So that's, that's the big difference. There's no blood test. There's no MRI. There's a set of credentials or a, a set of standards that were made up by other people. You know, not not like a disease. Now, if, you, if, if you have a disease, then, you know, there's an actual bona fide medical diagnosis for that disease. It's not speculative. So say that there is a Tai Chi master or a Qigong master in the hills in the Himalayas, and he spent all his life and he does nothing but meditate there. Well, take that same person and put him on the street of New York City, and he's mentally ill. You know, when he's up in the Himalayas, he's fine. You bring him down here to America in, this, in New York City, he's got a mental illness. And, so, and, it, and you know, the DSM-5 now, there's over 300 different diagnoses that they can give you for a mental illness. So they can literally classify basically anyone with a mental illness. You know, if a person doesn't agree with the government, they can say, well, this person has oppositional defiant disorder. You are mentally ill. We're going to take your gun. They're now saying that anti-Semitism is mental illness. It's a exactly. sign of right. mental yep. illness. Well, that's what they're pushing. That, that, that's a suggestion, right? Right. Well, they're all suggestions. But here, <laughs> what Alex said is really <laughs> very, very pertinent. It's a matter of context. You know, if you're nude in your house, and the curtains are drawn, you're not mentally ill. But if your curtains are not drawn, then you're definitely displaying and possibly mentally ill. And if you're doing it outside, walking downtown, then you're definitely, then you have to be pulled into custody. So this idea of grabbing people based on something that is the opinion of somebody or in context is not normal, according to experts, the when you are tested for some kind of bacterial infection or whatever, there's a good chance that what the results of your test have been replicated before or seen before, right? And right now there's all kinds of new conditions that are being shoved into this category of mental illness or abnormal behavior or behavior that is antisocial. And it started with, you know, the political correctness of the 80s where you weren't supposed to say certain things never supposed to um, call, <laughs> you weren't supposed to call people fat. You were supposed to say they had a glandular problem. <laughs> yeah. And you can, you couldn't call someone an Indian. They had to be a Native American. Yeah. I mean, we have all this, this politically correct, uh, what they call it in 1984, a new speak, yeah. right? Yeah. So, I mean, that's all playing out. So, Sophie, let me ask you, uh, so let's just say that, you know, they, they, they grab you and they do a mental evaluation and they say, okay, we think you have some kind of mental illness, some mental disorder. Is it incarceration or is it uh, medication or is it both? Because I, I sent you an article that was published out in the UK where there was a quote unquote study that was done that said that, you know, a million more people easily could be on antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications to help them with their anxiousness and their depression. So they're, they're obviously pushing the pharmaceutical aspect of this. So where do you think it goes once they grab you and say, hey, we think you're, you're not right in the head? It's definitely an opportunity to treat you. I also want to again say that it's an opportunity to harm you, to put on your record that you have a condition or symptoms that they have seen and they have noted. And this idea of, you know, making everybody their own catalog, which gets shared. I was reading a book proposal that was written by a friend of mine who was a doctor, and this was back in the early 90s. And he was writing, it was a very avant-garde idea about how medical records needed to be on a computerized system where doctors could share them and have immediate access to them. 
And now we don't want that, right? Because we want privacy. We don't want our information shared between insurance companies and schools and this entity and that entity. And then we have no privacy. It's all transparent. And the minute there's an, a notation made in your file that is contextually skewed or created for so, on some pretext, then you're toast. This calls into question also uh, Trump recently, right? He was on the news and he said, let's not worry about due process. That takes too much time. Well, let's take the person into custody first, take the guns, you know, that whole thing. You guys are probably very familiar with that footage. Mm -hmm. It was just about a week ago or so. So is it also, Sophia, in your mind, a way to circumvent the legal process and your rights? Well, of course. It's a crash induction into a kind of shackling where they're going, they can start treating you right away. And the minute they introduce um, drugs, chemicals into your body, that starts interfering with you in a very, very destru potentially destructive manner. And you don't have recourse because when you start losing control of who you are, when they're jabbing needles into you and forcing pills down your throat because they wear the white coats and you're in a bed in their um, building, what can you do? And you don't have anyone advocating for you. You have nobody to call. Or worse, if the person that you do call has fallen uh, you know, into their brainwashing and thinks you're actually being helped. So what do you do? What do you do, Mike? You are interviewing us as though we're the only people with anything to say, but I'm, I'm just a person who's fumbling through all this myself and trying to collate and keep things in order so that I don't lose sight of, for instance, the commerce and contracts, because that to me explains the financing and the, the whole execution of these events, right? So what do you think? Well, I think that um, they are certainly trying for, number one, the gun grab. I know there's some people that don't buy into that. But I think at the very least what they're going to try to do is they're going to try to uh, eliminate weapons that they consider to be weapons that, like the like assault weapons, semi-automatic weapons that can also be converted to automatic weapons. If you have guns, I think they want to get it down to handguns. That's my personal opinion. I don't know if they're ever going to get there, okay? But they're going to keep trying. That's number one. So I, I think that aspect of it is certainly in play. Because, I mean, we they have done it in other places of the world where they have stripped the guns away from the population. We can go to Australia. We can look at the UK. It's been done before. That's number one. Number two... I do believe that you're absolutely right with regard to the um, the people grab. And I, I do believe that they do want to take anybody who is in a position where they are a dissident, especially a dissident with influence. Somebody who's smart, somebody that may have a, a vehicle in which to share their thoughts and ideas, you know, to bring them in and say, look, we've got to assess you because you're out in left field. You're not running with the pack, and so we're going to have a, a mental evaluation. And they're going to mentally evaluate, and they're going to want to either force drugs on you if you refuse the drugs, and what's going to happen is they may incarcerate you. If you become incarcerated, you're going to have a criminal record. If you have a criminal record, there's going to be certain rights that you're not going to be able to execute, like if you have a felony, you can't vote. So I know this sounds very bizarre to a lot of people, you know, because they're thinking, wow, that sounds like crazy shit, Mike, that you're talking about. But, you know, <laughs> this is, like I said before, earlier in the show, if we go back 50 years ago and we see where we were back then and then fast forward 50 years to today, we're definitely in the funnel. So, yeah, and the reason why I'm asking you guys is because I'm hosting the show. But, you know, you're asking me my opinion. I'm, you know, I'll give you my opinion on this thing. I, I agree with everything that you guys are saying. Excellent points have been brought up. And it, it's also conditioning, as um, as Alex mentioned, and also yourself, Sophia, with regard to indoctrinating the young people into the police state so that you don't question a paramilitary presence in your life. 
at school. They're going to start with the kids. We know this. They don't care about us. We're too old. They figure another 10, 15, 20 years, we're not going to be here anyway. So they're, you know, they're starting with the young people to have a paramilitary presence in the streets. That's why they have their, their Humvees and they got their tanks or whatever else type of vehicles they got that are military vehicles that they deploy anytime you have any of these events. The perfect example of that, if anybody wants to go back and take a look and walk down memory lane, is to go back to the Boston bombing and take a look at what they did there. Entering into people's homes. As far as I was concerned, these are illegal searches. Agreed. It's the manifestation of the police state to keep the people who are in control, to keep them in control and to grow and expand their control. They want to control everything. They control every aspect, virtually every aspect of your life to begin with. They control your academia. They control your government. They control your courts. They control your military. They control your banks. Go pick something else. You, you guys know I've done a lot of work with regard to their control in the music industry. They own Hollywood. So when everybody goes marching off to a uh, to go watch a movie, they're being indoctrinated. And what do we see in these movies and television shows? What we're seeing all the time is the glorification of police, the glorification of a military presence. It's cool to wear a uniform. It's cool to have guns. It's cool to shoot and to maintain control and be the tough guy. And this is what they are selling to the public. And the kids especially, and many, many adults are completely and totally on board with this. They're acclimated. People want authority. They want authority to tell them what to do, when to do it, and where to do it. And we see this all over the place. There are those of us, the three people on this call, that are awake and aware and doing everything we can to try to keep our distance from this. But we are a very small minority of the population, a minuscule minority of the population. Virtually everybody else is basically on board with this. And, and on board, not because they sit there and openly embrace it, but because they're apathetic. They can give a shit less. They don't care. They don't care. Whatever happens, happens. They don't give it a single thought. So there you go. You asked me and I went on a monologue. <laughs> it was very good. Now, I have to go very soon. Okay. Okay. Can I put my two cents in with that? Sure, sure. Okay. So going back, going far back here, to the back to the mental health aspect again, one thing that they're doing is they're labeling us. They have to give us a label. So you have all these 300-plus diagnoses in the DSM-5. So they bring us in, they label us, and that's one way to categorize us. So this person doesn't agree with the government. So they have oppositional defiant disorder. Boop, so they can't have a gun. This person has something else. Boom, they don't have a gun. Now they want to run through um, and and pass and make sure everyone has this biometric ID. So all that information is going to be entered on your biometric ID, which is going to be on your passport. It's going to be on your driver's license. So when the police stop you, they're going to have all this information at their fingertips. Oh, let's see. Oh, yeah, you uh, you saw a psychologist at one time. You know, what was that all about? Um, so part of that is labeling. Another thing, like you were saying, is the control. And the one, the one difference between the United States and these other countries that have had the guns taken away is we have a constitutional amendment that specifically says that we have the right to keep and bear arms. Now, that doesn't mean that they aren't going to try their very best to take them away. In fact, Diane Feinstein, I was watching Diane Feinstein when um, Trump was talking about, you know, just doing away temporarily with people's due process to get the guns. And she was absolutely giddy over that. I mean, she was like a squirrel girl who had just been asked to the prom by the football captain. She was rubbing her hands and smiling and licking her lips. It was really, it was really troubling to me. Um, it was quite disgusting, but you know, they would, they would love to ban all the guns. Um, I don't think that they're, at least in my lifetime, I don't, I don't think that, I don't know if they'll ever do it because um, they say that China has the largest official military, but really the largest military is the American people. There are 300,000 hunters just in my state alone, and you hardly ever hear of a hunting accident. 
You know, you have all these people out and all these because these are law. Unless you're Dick Cheney. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, these are law abiding citizens. They know how to handle the guns. They, they show the proper respect, but they don't want to give them up. And I think, you know, they're trying to pass the bill or they want to pass a bill to take away all the AR 15s. I can tell you right now, people are not going to turn in their AR 15s. They're going to hide them. They're going to, they're going to do something with them. They are not going to go, uh, well, they passed a law. I guess I better turn it in. Um, but you know, this is, this is all about control. And right now as a police officer, if I, and I'm not saying in any way that there are not people out there who are mentally ill, because obviously there are people who are mentally ill. I'm not saying that there aren't. But as a police officer, I have a certain amount of power to judge a, pe a person's behavior. And if I deem them a threat to themselves or to the public, I can detain that person for a 72-hour evaluation. I've only done it a handful of times, but when I've done it, there was a justification for it because I knew that that person was going to harm themselves or they were going to harm somebody else. Um, they would like for you to... You know, even if there's a question, maybe they will, maybe they won't go ahead and get them in for service. I'm not going to do that. If they can dictate to me what day it is, where they live, uh, what's going on in the world, then I'm not going to take their due process rights away with them. Because I know as soon as they if they're not already in the system, they're just going to go for three for three days for 72 hours. They could be institutionalized at the very minimum. They're going to be given psychotropic drugs. Um so I'm very cognizant of the fact that, you know, I'm I am not going to do that to someone because I don't know what's going on in that person's life. Maybe they just had a death in the family. Um, maybe their child just died. Maybe they're going through, you know, a terrible divorce. Maybe they're trying to get away from an abusive spouse. Um, and I think I wish there were more police officers that thought along those lines instead of just hoorah, I'm going to go out and make arrests because, you know, I'm not like that. Um, I really never have been. Um, and when I raised my hand, I took it. I did take an oath to the Constitution. I did not take an oath to government. And I think there's a big difference. Um, I'm, I'm very civil minded, so, uh, civil liberties. Um, I'm very libertarian minded. Um, and I, I, I always try and not lose sight of that. Um, because I believe in people's rights. So that's kind of my, that's, that's kind of my two cents on, on that. I know I'm not the average police officer. Um, and I've noticed just in the last few years, I have more and more people coming up to me and thanking me. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for putting your life on the line. And when I first started, hardly anybody ever said that, but it's that indoctrination. It's that, you know, put these police officers on a pedestal because, you know, they're out risking their lives and they're, they're, you know, attacking would-be school shooters and and so you know it's been a slow indoctrination but i but you know i see it every day and i go in places and they want to give me free food and i hardly ever will 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 do that i will say no i don't want this free please please let me pay for it and they just look at me dumbfounded and the customers look at me dumbfounded and i just tell them i am no better than you there is no reason why i should get a free meal and the people behind me shouldn't Good for you, Alex. We need you know, a lot more like you. So let me just, uh, we're going to wrap up because I know, Sophia, you are pressed for time. So before we do head out, I just want to say this was a great conversation. We covered a lot of ground in two hours, and I hope the audience appreciates um, the insights that both Sophia and um, Alex have brought to the table here. So, but before we go, uh, Sophia, do you have any you know parting thoughts about this thing in Florida or these uh, these events in general? I have a parting thought about Alex's free meal offers. <laughs> <laughs> I think okay. you should donate your free meal to the guy behind you. Just uh, say that and see if they I, give it to that person. Actually, I have done something similar to that when they've just absolutely insisted I will. I have paid for the person behind me. That is noble. You are a noble human being. Good now, for you. It's just the right thing to do. Alex, parting thoughts? Um, just one quick parting thought. You know, you have these events like Parkland and all these other events, and there's always – you always see these GoFundMe sites go up. Now, this is a very wealthy community here in Parkland in that part of Broward County. And at last time I checked, there were almost $3 million in donations total given to all these various people who put up these these websites – but I think that what the GoFundMe side is, I think this is the slush fund to to help pay for these events. 
you know, obviously if people aren't really getting shot and people aren't really getting hurt, then they probably aren't really getting this money. Maybe some of them are, but I think one of the things that the GoFundMe accounts do is help pay for the next event. Just a thought. Interesting. No, I mean, well, why discount it? I mean, you know, it's not like they're real upstanding pillars of society. I'm talking about the people involved with this stuff. So, you know, that wouldn't be beyond their their way of thinking. Well, again, I just want to thank both you, Sophia and Alex, for coming on the show. And uh, I'm going to turn the show around very quickly. I'm going to have it out within a week for sure, because I want to keep it very current, because uh, the Florida event is still in front of people. And so we'll catch their attention. So, Thank you so much for uh, coming on the show, and I'll talk to you guys soon. All right. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. And that concludes another Sage of Quay interview, and I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. Links to my guests' websites and social media are listed in the show notes below. And as always, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and visiting the blog. You can get to the blog by typing in sageofquayradio.blogspot.com or simply head over to our hub website at sageofquay.com. Also, if you get a moment, please visit laboroflovemusic.com to listen to my album, Leaving Dystopia. And remember, live in truth and always serve creation. It's really that simple. See everyone next week. Be safe, enjoy, and God bless. Just a cog because you're on.